Bentley was about to cry out for a third time that he hadn't done it when the images that dreadful day broke upon him. They came in chaos, the red and gold sun, Helga and her blood, and Bentley was no longer sure of the sequences. He remembered sleeping and waking, remembered being in the bathroom and looking out the window at the woods, but he couldn't remember if he'd done it that morning. He remembered Helga's dead face, and he remembered her loving him, but shock had thrown splinters of memory at him so chaotically that he no longer knew what was true about himself. The borrowed heart of a thousand warriors pealed again, telling him that every mortal's hell is unique and like no other, and beseeching him to summon his power to strike back at the being who had crafted the torments of all lives, and was now cursing his. Bentley choked back the third cry of denial. He heard his heart. He forced himself to look at what he would some day be. And in the looking at the figure that stood before him, Bentley Ellicott knew at last what he had always feared more than anything else in the world. He had always dreaded losing his childhood and becoming a disbelieving, defeated man. I know what happened to you, he cried. When Ombra beat you, he didn't kill you. He filled you full of lies and ruined your life. Then he made you live it. The middle-aged man, leaning on his cane, frowned slightly. Beat me, he murmured. Omer didn't, Omer didn't beat me. He lost. I won. Bentley had no words to answer. His last hope had just died within him. He was frozen by the horror of what was dawning on him. This really was what, the, what he would inescapably be. I won, the adult Bentley Ellicott repeated. His voice was low. Bentley could barely hear it. The fierce light behind the figure was bright in his eyes. Now, live. Live my half-century and more. Suffer what you have made me suffer. The daydreams will wither away. Love will fail you. Finally, you will have nothing. You will wish for nothing. Look forward to nothing. You will want to die and be afraid of dying. Suddenly, Bentley could no longer resist what was being said to him. The great will of his thousand brothers was retreating before the panic and uncertainty of a mortal child. Don't you remember anything, he asked, forcing back his tears. You don't die. You go back. Don't you even remember that part? I told you, the daydreams fade. It wasn't a daydream, Bentley cried. I didn't make it up. I remember the angel telling me. It was a daydream, the specter of his future self said with such vehemence that the words spat from him. There is no perfection. You invented the angel, the angel just as you invented Cannonball Jones. Bentley felt as if he were walking in a darkness of his own making. He heard the cry of his borrowed heart, but he no longer knew if it was real or only part of the fantasy in which he had lived his life. I'd rather be dead than be like you, he cried. Then stop your life where it is, hissed the creature who confronted him. Sunlight glinted on the silver band uh, as the middle-aged man raised his cane and pointed at the edge of the cliff. Destroy the evil that is in you. Jump. This is your true destiny. Jump or you will become me. The sun was blinding Bentley. The crashing of the waves and the unbearable knowledge of what he had done surrounded, um, resounded within him. He was terrified of falling and smashing his body on the rocks far below, but he had promised the cavern angel that he would sacrifice his mortal life if he had to in the struggle against the dreaded one. He tried desperately to remember his birth as reality, not a dream. If he refused to jump, he would be conceding to his monstrous self that there never had been a cavern angel, that heaven itself, which makes life on earth endurable, was just something Bentley Ellicott had made up. In the tumult of light and noise, he looked wildly around in a last frantic impulse to escape. He saw the blinding flash of sunlight on the sea. He saw Slally staring at him in terror and pity. He saw the wooden chair and the gray man. He saw the grassy meadow sloping down to the wall on the road. And in that careening blur of the world, Bentley saw what a thousand other warriors of God had seen at the moment of their supreme peril and choice. Somebody else was watching him. The cavern angel was nearby, looking at him, wordlessly demanding that Bentley decide between mortal despair and what his heart had always told him was true. Bentley's heart cried out with renewed power, as he saw its truth confirmed in the eyes of the cavern angel. There is an eternal perfection. He was one of the countless children and its chosen warrior. 
Then, in a burst of rage and joy, Bentley knew that the grown up on the cliff had told him evil's most blasphemous lie that there is no hope. This became the supreme fault, this being supreme falsehood. Everything else the contemptuous, despairing man had said to him was false, too. He whirled around and faced the gaunt monstrosity that wasn't him and never would be. You're still Ombra, he yelled. I was born to fight you. Ombra dwells in every mortal heart, O oh fool of God, roared the Lord of Nightmares. We live but to die. There is no Bentley threw the stone. He threw it with all his skill, his arm looping high, his twisted leg lifting off the ground as he flung the stone of Ra as hard as he could. Quartz and silver flashed in the sunlight as the stone hurtled across the space between Bentley and his enemy. It struck Prince Ombra in the face, spinning him backward. A death shout split the air, louder than the pounding of the surf, mightier than the wind. It was answered by the outraged cry of Bentley's heart. He saw the stone rattle down the bluff and plunge into a wave that was receding from the rocks, drawing its power away from the northern coast. Bentley saw Prince Ombra fall, bloodied and dying. Then Bentley Ellicott, the thousand and first hero of the borrowed heart, saw no more. Richard got out of his car. He had suddenly remembered what he could say to keep Ellen from leaving him. He walked across the driveway. Ellen was standing beside Rupert Drake. She looked puzzled. Something got into me, Richard said, ignoring the man beside her. Ellen remembered the day she had irrationally flared at Dr. Christie. Something got into me one time, too, she said. I was so afraid you didn't love me anymore that I wanted to hurt you as much as I could, Richard said, telling the truth he had finally learnt, remembered to tell. I'll always love you, Ellen answered, remembering that he needed to be told that as much as she did. Oblivious to her ex-husband, she kissed Richard. Where are our kids? Richard held her for a moment. I don't know, but I've suddenly got the strangest feeling. What is it, darling? It's going to be all right, Richard said, touching her face. Something's changed. I know it's going to be all right. Ellen felt it within, within and around her. The sudden surcrease of anxiety and doubt, the benevolence in the air, the light and the breeze from the sea. Yes, she said, something's gone, something that was here for a long time. Mike turned off the radio in the police station. He stood by McGraw's desk with a surprised expression on his face. I'll be damned, he said. McGraw looked at the radio. President's speech canceled. Crisis over. He looked at his two deputies. Sorry, gents, no war this week. What do you suppose happened? Dick Amberstam asked. Somebody got smart, McGraw said. He twisted his big body around and looked through the screen door at Main Street. Where in hell's that pickup truck? He said. Willie Bill drove off five, ten minutes ago, when I was coming in, Dick answered. Why? McGraw was about to tell him he ought to have himself tested for the stupids, because Dick knew that the, the pickup had been impounded for the inquest into Charlie's death, and that Dick should have stopped Willie Bill, but then McGraw remembered that nobody was perfect. He looked back through the screen door. The smoke had been cleared off by a fresh inshore wind. McGraw's heart was as bright as the sun on the water. He didn't understand what had happened to him. He was filled with a certainty that he had set aside years before. He knew that he would never hate or scorn again, and, he, and the knowing made him content. He had seen the eye of the beast. The beast was gone. Everyone it had touched, even Steve Slattery, had been helpless before the eye that had tried to blind McGraw in the stone yard. He remembered the yellow light in Steve's eyes. McGraw took a deep breath. Poor bastard, he muttered. Who? Mike asked. Steve, McGraw said. Mike raised his arms and clasped his hands behind his head. It's a stinking life, isn't it? McGraw turned his head. He studied his deputy for a moment. No, he said. Polly sat up on her bed. She brushed her hair back from her eyes. Who is it? she said. Open this door at once, snapped Mrs. Talley's voice from outside the trailer. Open it yourself, Polly answered. The door swung back and Mrs. Talley climbed up the two cinder blocks that were Polly's front steps. She glanced around the interior of the trailer. You're neat. I'll say that for you. Mrs. Talley, Polly said, I'm not in the mood for anything heavy. Not this afternoon. Mrs. Talley looked down at her. Suddenly, all the reserve seemed to drain out of her. She sat down on the bed beside Polly. I'm a fool, she said. I'm a judging, condemning fool. She looked at Polly. I ran into Mr. McGraw this morning at, at Dr. Leon's. He gave me a piece of his mind. 
I understand you were cooking Charlie Phoebe's meals and trying to clean up that pigsty you lived in. There isn't any law against it, Polly said. She was wary. Of course there isn't, Mrs. Tally said. Anybody with any brains finds out before they judge. Give me a tissue, will you? Polly reached for a box of tissues on her bedside table. She picked it up and started to cry. I only went to the hotel to make you mad, she sobbed. Mrs. Tally put her arms around the girl. As the most loving thing anybody's ever done for me, she said. Polly lay her head on, on Mrs. Tally's shoulder. After, after I stopped being mad at you, I kept going over there because I felt sorry for him. I never did anything with him. Yes, Mrs. Tally said, pressing Polly close to her. Yes, I should have thought that too. Charlie Phoebe was a sad, forlorn man. Anybody with a kind heart could have seen it. She smoothed Polly's hair. Don't cry anymore. You have a kind heart. You have a treasure inside you, child. Now stop that crying. Polly got up. She pulled a tissue from the box and wiped her eyes. I was afraid that you and Mr. Cutter were going to make me go away. We were, said Mrs. Tally's voice behind her. But, but we're stopping such foolishness. Polly turned around. Maybe he still wants it. Mrs. Tally stood up. What Elias Cutter wants is somebody to be nice to him. We'll have him around for supper this evening. But don't you worry about Elias Cutter, Mrs. Tally said. I've had that old goat's number for years. She looked through the trailer windows at the bright afternoon. I've just never done anything for him. I could make a moussaka, Polly said. Mrs. Tally looked back at her. We'll splurge and get a rib roast. But I'd like to. A rib roast, Mrs. Tally said firmly. Polly grinned. Yes, Mrs. Tally. Willie Bill stood at the foot of the meadow. His pickup truck was parked on the other side of the wall. He had seen everything that had happened at the top of the cliff. He stood with his hands shoved into the back pockets of his jeans. The cicadas buzzing lazily in the tree behind him. Willie Bill shifted a toothpick from one side of his mouth to the other. The tall grass was bending in a freshening breeze. Willie Bill saw Slally standing at the upper end of the meadow. She was beckoning frantically with both hands. The stranger took the, pick up, the, took the toothpick out of his mouth and snapped it in two between his thumb and forefinger. He began to climb the slope. The grass brushed his thighs, and his hard body was bent forward as he moved upward in long, even strides. His head was down and his face was almost hidden by the brim of his hat. The wind was so loud in his ears that he could only hear snatches of what, Sally was, what Slally was crying to him. He was almost out of breath when he got to the top of the cliff. The wind gusted and flipped his hat off. He grabbed it just before it blew away. Slally was standing beside Bentley. Her hair was flying and her face was pinched with worry. Bentley lay in the grass, one leg bent underneath the other. His arms were flung out, away from his body. His face was turned to one side. He was bleeding from a gash on his right cheekbone. His chest rose and fell in a sleeper's breathing. Slally seized Willie Bill's hand and tugged at him. We have to get him home, she cried. Her voice was as clear as the afternoon light. He's hurt himself and I can't lift him. With the little girl pulling at his arm, Willie Bill raised his head. He narrowed his eyes and looked at something that was far beyond the sun and sky. With his free hand, he held his hat against his chest and listened. Slally stopped tugging at him when she realized that he was hearing a sound that was not of this world. The voices of God, which are the one voice of all gods that have ever been worshipped, were speaking to Willie Bill. Heaven ordered its angel to reward its warrior, to give him what his soul yearned for more than anything else. Willie Bill nodded. Slally let go of his hand. She stood watching uh, with the wind tossing her hair as Willie Bill lowered himself to one knee beside Bentley. Willie Bill set his hat on the grass. His jade eyes were gray as he turned Bentley's face up into the light of the sun. Then Willie Bill, the cavern angel, put his forefinger on Bentley's lips. Hush, he whispered. Don't tell what you know. And that's it for that chapter. And then there's just the epilogue tomorrow.